Greetings, everybody. Pa Chaplain Bob here. Light of the World Ministries in John 8, 12. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And Jesus is that light of life. This is going to be part two of Strangers in the Bible. Possibly the end. I'm not sure. But um, we're going to find out that sometimes the strangers were Israel. So let's continue in Obadiah. Uh, we're going to start in, um, oh, I guess we'll start in Obadiah chapter 1, verse 5. We read run through 4 through the in the first part. So let's make this the second part. And we're talking about Esau, Edom. Verse 5. If thieves came to thee, uh, came to thee, if robbers by night, how art thou cut off? Would they not have stolen till they had enough? If the grape gatherers, gatherers came to thee, would they not leave some grapes? How are the things of Esau searched out? How are his hidden things sought up? And we're talking about his evil plans, you know, being searched. Uh... You can't hide anything from the Lord. So, Verse 7. All the men of thy confederacy have brought thee even to the border. The men that were at peace with thee have deceived thee and prevailed against thee. They that eat thy bread have laid a wound under thee. There is none understanding in him. Shall I not in that day, saith the Lord, even destroy destroy the wise men out of Edom and understanding out of the Mount of Esau. Doesn't sound like God likes Esau and he's Edom. Verse 9. And thy mighty men, O Timon, shall be dismayed to the end that every one of the Mount of Esau may be cut off by slaughter. Cut off by slaughter. Do you know if you re if you remove the S from slaughter, you know what that word is? Laughter. Because the evildoers, when God gets rid of them, there's going to be happiness and, and laughter. The Lord, you know, I did a, an entire Bible study on uh, God laughs. You know, all these evil people make plans, what they're going to do, how they're going to rule the world, and God's laughing at them. Oh yeah, you think you're going to do that? I'll let you get by with it for a while. But when it's time for the kingdom of Christ, ain't going to happen, buddy boy. Okay. And thy mighty men, O Timon, shall be dismayed to the end that every one of the Mount of Esau may be cut off by slaughter. Verse 10. Listen to this. This is, this is important. For thy violence against thy brother Jacob. Uh, who are they talking about? They're talking about Esau Edom, who was Jacob Israel's brother. His twin. Maybe not an identical twin, but, you know. For thy violence against thy brother Jacob, shame shall cover thee, and thou shalt, uh, and thou shalt be cut off forever. I would not want to be cut off from the Lord forever. No, uh-uh. Now, remember... Uh, Esau, as a group of people, attacked Israel. And here it is. Where's the brotherly love? Verse 11. Keep this in mind. Um, now, I believe this is referring to when Babylon, the Babylonians, King Nebuchadnezzar, attacked and destroyed Jerusalem and took it into, uh, the ones that weren't killed were taken into captivity. 
this is what it's talking about. Some people fled from Jerusalem to try to escape the mayhem. So let's read about it. Verse 10, For thy violence against thy brother Jacob, shame shall cover thee, and thou shalt be cut off forever. In the day that thou stoodest on the other side, in the day that the strangers, the Babylonians, carried away captive his forces, and foreigners entered into his gates, and cast lots upon Jerusalem, even thou wast as one of them. So here it is, instead of Esau, Edom, being grieved at what happened to their brother, they were like one of them. They were like happy. Verse 12. But thou should have not have looked on the day of thy brother in the day that he became a stranger. Whoa! Whoa, 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 whoa. What? Hold on a second here. Let, let's read that again. But thou shouldest not have looked on the day of thy brother in the day that he became a stranger. Stranger. That's what this Bible study is about. Stranger. We're going to read this again uh, later on. Neither shouldest thou have rejoiced. Ah. So here it is. Jerusalem's being destroyed. And the Edomites, the Esau Edomites, are rejoicing. They're happy about it. They're celebrating. They're having a party. Neither should thou have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction. Neither shouldest thou have spoken proudly in the day of distress. Hmm. Thou shouldest not have entered into the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. So evidently, uh, Esau looks like they went and helped the Babylonians. It looks like it. Thou shouldest not have entered into the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Yea, thou shouldest not have looked on their affliction in the day of their calamity, nor have laid hands on their substance in the day of their calamity. So they went in and took their things. 14. Neither shouldest thou have stood in the crossway to cut off those of his that did escape. So here it is. Those that were able to escape Jerusalem, the children of Esau Edom, blocked them off. Neither shouldest thou have delivered up those of his that did remain in the day of distress. Wow. For the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen. I think I'm going to do a Bible study on day of the Lord. I think that's, that's on my list. But uh, I'm starting a new job soon. So uh, I'm not sure how that's going to work out. Verse 15, for the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen, as thou hast done. It shall be done unto thee. Thy reward shall return upon thine own head. So Esau, what you did to the children of Judah and Jerusalem, it's going to come upon you. It's called, uh, some people call it karma. Verse 16. For as ye have drunk upon my holy mountain, so shall all the heathen drink continually. Yea, they, they shall drink, and they shall swallow down, and they shall be as though they had not been. That's right. Your best life is now. Because you're going to be, there's going to be a day they don't even exist anymore. 17. But upon Mount Zion shall be deliverance, and there shall be holiness. And the house of Jacob, Israel, and the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. 
Listen to this carefully. And the house of Jacob, Israel, and the house of Jacob shall be a fire. I did an entire series on what the Bible says about fire. Oh, yeah. And the house of Joseph, a flame. And the house of Esau for stubble. What is stubble? Well, when you got wheat, you take the stalks of wheat and you shake off the wheat kernels and then all the stuff that's left over from the plant that you can't really eat, that's stubble. And you know what they do with stubble? They burn it. Put it back into the ground and use it as fertilizer for the next crop. And the house of Jacob shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame, and the house of Esau for stubble, and they shall kindle in them and devour them. Have you ever heard of kindling a fire? Oh yeah, starting a fire, kindling. And they shall kindle in them and devour them, and there shall not be any remaining of the house of Esau, for the Lord hath spoken it. And there's people tell you, well, you know, that was before Jesus came and now Jesus loves everybody and he's going to save everybody. I don't think so. This is why they tell people don't read the Old Testament because you'll get confused. Yeah. Yeah. Because when you listen to these lying pastors and wolves behind the pulpit and they tell you the exact opposite of what the Bible says, you're going to be confused. And there shall not be any remaining of the house of Esau, for the Lord has spoken it. You know who is, was uh, probably the most famous Edomite in the Bible, the house of Esau? King Herod, Herod's family. According to Josephus, a Jewish historian, who I believe believed in Jesus, by the way, I think he did, he said that uh, uh, Herod was the Herod family, you know, the Herod family, the ones that tried to kill all the children in Bethlehem, who slaughtered all the babies in Bethlehem to kill the Messiah. Yeah, that Herod. He was of the house of Esau. And from what I understand, the Edomites uh, helped, I forget what Roman emperor, well, he was a Roman general, and then he became emperor. Maybe I should look it up. Uh, one of the some of the Edomites um, helped Caesar defeat Pompey. You could read, you could look this stuff up. You know, you look it up if you want. But according to what I was reading here. King Herod the Great, they call him, uh, came to the aid of the a Roman general Gaius Sosius, G A I U S S O S I U S. Uh, Herod and the Rome, this Roman general, took Jerusalem in 37 B.C. And if you look in all the uh, history books, they say BCE, BCE, BCE to them means before the common era, and then CE stands for common era, common as in, I don't, well, if you ask me, BCE means before the Christian era, and CE means Christian era. In other words, BCE and CE is turning the dating of our calendar due to the birth of Christ. It's a denial. So when you see BCE and CE, you know you're dealing with Antichrist. Well, guess who owns the publishing companies? Oh, yeah. So, yeah. yeah I did a video on BCE and CE, too. Um, so when, uh, the Edomites under Herod helped Rome retake Jerusalem, 
they made uh, Herod ruler. And of course, when Christ was born, uh, Bethlehem, the Herod family decided, oh, we got to get rid of this guy. We don't want a, a king of Israel. So, And the house of Jacob shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame, and the house of Esau for stubble, and they shall kindle in them and devour them, and there shall not be any remaining of the house of Esau, for the Lord has spoken it. And they of the south shall possess the mount of Esau, and they of the plain the Philistines, and they shall possess the fields of Ephraim, and the fields of Samaria, and Benjamin, and shall possess Gilead. And the captivity of this host of the children of Israel shall possess that of the Canaanites, even unto Zarephath and the captivity of Jerusalem, which is in Zepharad, and shall possess the cities of the south. And saviors shall come up on Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. All right, so uh, let's see. All right, so let's go back to uh, verse 10. All right, so let's take a look at Obadiah chapter 1, verse 10. Uh, now, we're talking about Edom, Esau, Edom. For thy violence against thy brother Jacob, and Jacob Israel, Shame shall cover thee, and thou shalt be cut off forever. It doesn't sound like the Lord likes Esau, Edom, does it? No. In the day that thou stoodest on the other side, in the day that the, the strangers, the Babylonians, in the day that the strangers carried away captive his forces, and foreigners entered into his gates, and cast lots upon Jerusalem. Now we're talking about Jerusalem was the capital of Judah. Samaria was the capital of northern Israel. They're not the same. I don't care what your lying preachers say. They're idiots. They're well, they're not idiots. They're well, they're idiots for serving the devil, but they're deceivers and wolves and serpents and yeah. And foreigners entered into his gates and cast lots upon Jerusalem. Even thou wast as one of them. But thou shouldest not have looked on the day of thy brother. I remember Esau, Edom, and Jacob, Israel are brothers. Grandchildren of Abraham. So listen to this carefully. But thou, Esau... Shouldest not on the looked on the day of thy brother Israel, in the day that he, Israel, became a stranger. Judah became a stranger in Israel. They became a stranger. How could they be a stranger? We're going to find out in a few minutes. Neither shouldest thou have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction. Neither shouldest thou have spoken proudly in the day of distress. Let's go to the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah was a major prophet, major in size and major in importance. Um, Jeremiah is depressing to me anyways. It's all about judgment for the people and their wickedness. And they just, mm. uh, God had had a belly full and it made him sick in his stomach. Figure of speech, people. Yeah. So let's read Jeremiah chapter 3. Now, verse 1. Jeremiah 3, verse 1. They say, if a man put away his wife, divorce, right? If a man put away his wife and she go from him and become another man's wife, 
Shall he return unto her again? Shall not that land be greatly polluted? But thou, Israel, but thou hast played the harlot. Uh, that's a ten. That's a twenty-dollar word for a whore. But thou hast played the harlot with many lovers. Now we're talking about Israel being a whore for other gods, which are the fallen angels. But thou hast played the harlot with many lovers. Yet return again to me, saith the Lord. Now there's a Bible verse that says that the Lord is slow to anger and quick to forgive. You know, the Lord's calling Israel, come to me. I love you. You're like my wife. But they ran off and was a whore with every demon out there. But he still loves his bride and wants her to return to him. You want to read a real love story. I mean a real love story. Read the book of Hosea. I did an entire study on it. Multi -part, multiple parts playlist. Hosea. Man, what a love story. Uh, uh, it's a story of God's love towards his bride Israel. All right, let's keep reading here. But thou hast played the harlot with many lovers, yet return again to me, saith the Lord. Lift up thine eyes unto the high places, and see where thou hast not been lying with. You know, like a, like a whore that laid down on the bed with many men. In the ways hast thou sat for them as the Arabian in the wilderness, and thou hast polluted the land with thy whoredoms and with thy wickedness. Therefore the showers, rain showers, therefore the showers have been withholden, and there hath been no latter rain, and thou hadst a whore's forehead. Uh, don't ask me what a whore's forehead is, because I, I don't know. I don't, I, I don't know. And thou hadst a whore's forehead, thou refusest to be ashamed. See, they're proud of what they did. Uh, they're not ashamed that they hurt the Lord's feelings. Verse 4. Wilt thou not from this time cry unto me, My father, thou art the guide of my youth? Will he reserve his anger forever? Will he keep it to the end? Behold, thou hast spoken and done evil things as thou couldest. That's right. God's people did evil things. The Lord said also unto me in the days of Josiah the king. I did a Bible study on Josiah the king. He was a good king. Just before the Lord unleashed his wrath on his, well, Judah. Josiah was a good king. I hope to meet him one day. Boy, I'll tell you what, you wouldn't believe some of the things Josiah did. He got rid of the um, the men that like to play with other men via the back door, if you catch my drift. And uh, he got rid of the Satanists. Got rid of them. And no, he didn't buy them a Greyhound bus ticket to leave town. Oh, they left town all right, but uh, yeah. Yeah, they, they left the town. The Lord said also unto me in the days of Josiah the king, Hast thou seen that which backsliding Israel hath done? She has gone up upon every high mountain, and under every green tree, and there hath played the harlot. See, they, they climb the high mountain, and they do their little satanic rituals, and they think they're climbing their stairway to heaven. Ripping off a Ze Led Zeppelin. Uh, yeah, I must have listened to that song uh, 150, 250, 500 times in my day. But that's what they would do. And it says, under every green tree, uh, witches consider uh, nature sacred. Matter of fact, Holly 
uh, as in the wood of a holly, Hollywood. Holly is reputedly uh, what they make magic wands out of. And oaks were considered sacred trees. So, I don't know. That's what I've heard. I don't know. I've never practiced it. Although I did study the New Age for a while. So she, Israel, has gone up upon every high mountain and under every green tree, and there has played the harlot. Verse 7, listen to this. And I said, after she had done all these things of evil, and I said, after she had done all these things, turn thou unto me. Israel, you've been a whore. You've been unfaithful. But return to me. I love you. Turn thou unto me. But she returned not. And her treacherous sister Judah saw it. So not only was Israel bad, Judah, like a sister, is watching it. Verse 8. Listen to this carefully. Jeremiah 3 and verse 8. Very important verse. And I, the Lord, I, and I saw when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, spiritual adultery, I, the Lord, I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not, but went and played the harlot also. God divorced Israel. You, you, you will never hear uh, any 501c3 church business pastor ever preach this. Never, never, never. God gave Israel, northern Israel, capital of Samaria, a bill of divorce. Jerusalem was the capital of Judah. And they watched everything that happened to Israel, but yet they did the same things. Yeah. The Assyrians came and took northern Israel, and the Assyrians uh, came in and took Samaria, their capital of Israel, and took them into captivity, those that they didn't kill. And then, uh, I pull, I'm not sure how many years passed, but maybe 100, 150 years later, maybe less, maybe more, I don't know. I'd have to look it up. But, um, oh, the Assyrians took a little, some of uh, Judah too. They, they took some of the uh, outlining cities. But the Assyrians tried to take uh, Jerusalem, but they couldn't do it. There was an angel that actually killed 85,000 Assyrian troops when they tried to take Jerusalem. They surrounded Jerusalem. Yeah. Oh, you never heard of that? Well, read your Bible, people. So, God divorced Israel, but, but yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not, but went and played the harlot also. Verse 9. And it came to pass through the lightness of her whoredom, that she defiled the land and committed adultery with stones and with stocks. Um, idols, people. Idols. You take a, a rock and you carve it and say, oh, this is my God. Let me, let me worship my God. Uh, no thanks. Verse 10. And yet for all this, her treacherous sister Judah hath not turned unto me with her whole heart, but feignedly saith the Lord. Uh, feignedly. Have you ever heard of a, like your, you call up work and you feign a sickness? Hey boss, uh, <coughs> I'm sorry, I can't make the work today. I'm, <coughs> I'm sick. Yeah, that's feigning. Yeah. So Judah was pretending, but 
she didn't follow the Lord with her whole heart. And yet for all this, her treacherous sister Judah hath not turned unto me with her whole heart, but feignedly saith the Lord. And the Lord said unto me, The backsliding Israel, that God divorced by the way, the backsliding Israel hath justified herself more than treacherous Judah. So God divorced Israel, but she was better than even Judah. And why did God not divorce Judah? Because God made an everlasting promise to King David that he would always have a man or, a, or a, somebody from his family line to sit upon the throne of David. And ultimately, it's going to be Christ, which is why Christ was born, uh, well, sort of kind of via Joseph. That's why Joseph, who is of the tribe of Judah, is likened to the earthly uh, line of Christ. And Elizabeth, who was John the Baptist's mother, uh, Mary, they were cousins. And I think Mary was of the tribe of Levi. I know Elizabeth was, and they were cousins, Mary and Elizabeth. I believe they were both of the tribe of Levi. I know Elizabeth was, but I don't know about Mary. So can you see Christ would be the merging of the priest and the king? Because the Levites were the priest tribe. They were the ones that served the Lord in the temple. And then King David was the tribe of the kings. Um, everything that pertained to the sacrifices and religion and God's law, as far as like the Ten Commandments and what have you, that was for the tribe of Levi. But for, let's say, when they caught a murderer, the king tribe were the ones that would order them to be put to death. Well, that's how it's supposed to work. Murderers were supposed to be put to death. You did a capital crime in God's law, you were to be put to death. And that's, abominations were capital crimes. Uh, that's just the way it was supposed to be. We don't do that anymore. So, and then we wonder why things are so messed up. All right, so, uh, Jeremiah 3, 11. And the Lord said unto me, The backsliding Israel hath justified herself more than treacherous Judah, Go and proclaim these words toward the north, the north was Israel, and say, Return, thou backsliding Israel, saith the Lord, and I will not cause mine anger to fall upon you, for I am merciful, saith the Lord, and I will not keep anger forever. Oh God, praise God for that. Only acknowledge thine iniquity, Acknowledge your wickedness and sins that thou hast transgressed against me, saith uh, against the Lord thy God, and hast scattered thy ways to the strangers under every green tree, and ye have not obeyed my voice, saith the Lord. Turn, O backsliding children, saith the Lord, for I am married unto you, and I will take you one of a city and two of a family, and I will bring you to Zion. What a day that's going to be. That's going to happen in the day of the Lord's return. And like I mentioned, I'm going to probably do a series or video on day of the Lord versus the day of Christ. And if you listen to the pre-trib rapture crowd, they'll tell you, well, the day of Christ is uh, the pre-trib rapture and the day of the Lord is at the end of the tribulation when God, you know, Christ finally returns and destroys all the wicked. Isn't that basically denying that Jesus Christ is Lord? No, the day of Christ and the day of the Lord is the same event. But the day of the Lord is upon the head of the wicked, whereas the day of Christ is for the righteous whose righteousness is, is, is in their faith with Christ. There's going to be a difference. If you're in Christ, it's the day of Christ. And if you're not in Christ, well, then it's the day of the Lord. Because Jesus Christ is Lord. 
Turn, O backsliding children, saith the Lord, for I am married unto you, and I will take you one of a city and two of a family, and I will bring you to Zion. And I will give you pastors, according to mine heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. We don't have too many of them today. And it shall come to pass, when ye be multiplied and increased in the land, in those days, saith the Lord, they shall say no more, the ark of the covenant of the Lord, neither shall it come to mind, neither shall they remember it, neither shall they visit it, neither shall that be done any more. At that time, they shall call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord, and all the nations shall be gathered unto it, to the name of the Lord, to Jerusalem. Neither shall they walk any more after the imagination of their evil heart. In those days, the house of Judah shall walk with the house of Israel. They're not the same people. They're different. And they shall come together out of the land of the north. What land is north of Israel? Uh, last time I looked at a map, it was Europe. What group of people built churches, printed Bibles, sent missionaries all over the world proclaiming Jesus Christ as Lord? Wasn't Africa, wasn't Japan, wasn't Mongolia, wasn't China, wasn't Brazil. No, it was Europe. In those days, the house of Judah shall walk with the house of Israel, and they shall come together out of the land of the north to the land which I have given for an inheritance unto your fathers. Wow. But I said, how shall I put thee among the children and give thee a pleasant land, a goodly heritage of the hosts of nations? And I said, thou shalt call me my father and shalt not turn away from me. Surely as a wife treacherously departeth from her husband, so have ye dealt treacherously with me, O house of Israel, saith the Lord. A voice was heard upon the high places, weeping and supplications of the children of Israel, for they have perverted their way, and they have forgotten the Lord their God. And people, that's where we are today. They have forgotten their God. Verse 22. Return ye backsliding children, and I will heal your backsliding. Behold, we come unto thee, for thou art the Lord our God. Truly in vain is salvation hoped for from the hills. Don't be climbing that stairway to heaven in the mountains, because you ain't going to find salvation there. Truly in vain is salvation hoped for from the hills and from the multitude of mountains. Truly in the Lord our God is the salvation of Israel. For shame hath devoured the labor of our fathers from our youth, their flocks and their herds, their sons and their daughters. We lie down in our shame, and our confusion covereth us. For we have sinned. For we have sinned against the Lord our God, we and our fathers, from our youth even unto this day, and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God. All right, let's go to Jeremiah 31, starting in verse 31. 31, 31, Jeremiah. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant. What is a covenant? It's like a contract. That I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not the same. Now remember, God divorced Israel, right? But he didn't divorce Judah. New covenant with Israel. Wow. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break. Oh, yeah. God made a covenant with them. They broke it. God didn't break his contract. They did. So he's going to have to make a new one. 
And there's actually idiots out there that'll tell you that they're going to go back to the old covenant. Jesus called them hypocrites because, you know, he, Jesus said, uh, you know, none of you keep the law. You don't keep the law. Told them they're a bunch of hypocrites. But we'll more on that later. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and they will be and and will be their god and they shall be my people god doesn't want the law on a tablet of stone no he wants the law in our hearts that's what he wants um you know Someone asked Jesus, what was the most important commandment? Matthew 22, 36. He said, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. Love the Lord with your heart, soul, and mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And hopefully you don't live next, you don't live next to Sodom or in the middle of Sodom. Or I hope you don't live next door to the Church of Satan, which was founded in uh, Los Angeles on, uh, I think it was June 6, 1966. You know, 666? Yeah. Yeah, I don't think I'm going to love those neighbors. On these two commandments hang all the law. All the law and the prophets. So love the Lord and love thy neighbor. And on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Wow. Think about it. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Jeremiah 31, verse 33. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they shall all know me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. The Lord's going to forget your sins. Thus saith the Lord, which giveth the sun for a light by day, and the ordinances of the moon and of the stars for a light by night, which divideth the sea when the waves thereof roar, the Lord of hosts is his name. If those ordinances, if the sun and the moon cease, if those ordinances depart from before me, saith the Lord, then the seed of Israel also shall cease from being a nation before me forever. And we're not talking about a antichrist bunch of people over in the Middle East created in 1948 by the United Nations, which is a satanic counterfeit. That's not what we're talking about here. If those ordinances depart from before me, saith the Lord, then the seed of Israel also shall cease from being a nation before me forever. Thus saith the Lord, if heaven above can be measured and the fountains of the earth searched out beneath, I will also cast off all the seed of Israel 
for all that they have done, saith the Lord. Wow. All right, let's read Ephesians chapter 2. Paul. Paul, an apostle. Anybody tells you Paul's not an apostle is a satanic deceiver. They either are a deceiver or they do, or they have they do not have the spirit of the Lord upon them. Period. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesus was a city in Greece, and Paul's preaching and teaching to the Greeks. Well, let's read this real quick. Verse 1. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, Satan, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our con conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Children of wrath. That was me growing up. Verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us. Yeah, sounds like Paul's a real great deceiver, huh? I'm being extremely sarcastic here. Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly, heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us through Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith. Oh no, the, the messianics will tell you, oh, you got to keep all these laws. You got to keep the Sabbath and you got to do this and you got to do that. And they don't even like the name of Jesus. They want you to say Yeshua, 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 Yeshua. Yeah, well, you watch. When they start mentioning that Yeshua has come in the Middle East and he's the Messiah, their Messiah, you better run. You better run like hell because that's where you'll be heading if you follow that one. And I'm not trying to be dramatic because that's going to be the mark of the beast and all that other. Yeah, no thank you. For by grace are ye saved through faith. Faith in what? Faith in Christ. For by grace are ye saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works. Lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past Gentiles, remember that word Gentile, it means nations. It's the same word. Sometimes it's, it's translated Gentiles, other times nations. Gentile does not mean non-Jew. Contrary to the lying wolves in the pulpits spreading all those lies. Wherefore, remember that ye, being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. Verse 12, listen carefully. Ephesians 2, 12, listen carefully. That at that time ye were without Christ being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. 
Why? Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 8. God divorced Israel. They had they were aliens from com the commonwealth of Israel. They were strangers from the covenants of promise because they were divorced. Remember in Obadiah was it verse uh, da, 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 Obadiah chapter 1 and verse 12? But thou, Esau, but thou shouldest not have looked on the day of thy brother, Israel, in the day that he became a stranger. Israel became a stranger. Let's go back to Ephesians. Verse, chapter 2, verse 12. But at that time, ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. That's right. Israel had no hope and were without God in the world. Verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who were sometimes were afar off, you were far off. You were divorced. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. What middle wall of partition? The partition between Israel and Judah. God divorced Israel, but not Judah. Verse 15, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, the hatred, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity or the hatred thereby, and came and preached peace to you, which were afar off, divorced Israel, and to them that were nigh, Judah. For, three, for through him we both have access by one spirit, the Holy Spirit, we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father, God the Father. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Wow. Let's read that again and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord. In the New Jerusalem, there's not going to be a temple. The Lord's going to be the temple. The Lord is the temple. The sacrifice. Verse 22, In whom ye are also built together for an habitation of God, through the Spirit. Ah, oh, boy. Does that make sense to you people? It does to me. It's as plain as day. But the preachers don't want you to know this stuff. They want you to think the Antichrist over in the Middle East, that those are God's people. Well, they are God's people, but the God of this world, the Prince of the Power of the Air, the God of this world. That's their people. The people that God, Jesus Christ referred to in John chapter 8, verse 44. I hope you learn something. I really do. You know, I, I don't do these things for my own health. You know, it takes, I, I don't mind doing them. It takes time. And, Sometimes I wonder if I'm wasting my time. I really do. Because there's so few of us. 
but uh, I would rather do this than watch sports or listen to satanic music. So I pray that each one of you that listen to this are blessed and, um, you know, things are going to be rough. When the man of sin appears, our faith is going to really be tested. Will you follow Christ and possibly even die for the faith? Or will you follow the Messiah of the Antichrist? Take your pick. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to God the Father and His only begotten Son, Jesus, who is the Christ, who shed His precious blood that us having faith in Him might be saved from the day of destruction. Praise God. In Jesus' name, amen.